There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Well, I'm delighted to welcome a brand new guest to Bite Size Book Chats. This is Ruth from Southern California. Hello, Ruth. Hello, Sean. It's so great to meet you. Ruth and I go way back um, on Booker's social media. I think Litzy is how I first became aware of you. How did you first become aware of me? I became first aware of you on the podcast Reading Envy. Yes. Reading back in the day. Envy. Back in the day. I think my first appearance there was 2016. And Jenny was a became a, a friend of mine, and she passed away earlier this year, very suddenly, and just just what a I can't get my head around it yet. Such a powerful force for book extremism, bookish extremism. She was just wonderful. Yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Uh, yes, we are here to talk about a book by an author that is one of my favorite authors, and a, an author that I obsessed with. And that is Elizabeth Jane Howard. And this is the opening, the first volume of her Cazalet Chronicles, The Light Years, originally published in 1990. I have not read any of the Cazalet Chronicles. And so I was so glad to be able to nab you to sing the praises of volume one of this series. Tell us about it. Ruth. Okay, well, that explains your interest in it, that you have read some of her earlier stuff. This is the only book of hers that I've read, and I certainly intend on reading the further four books in the Cazalet Chronicles. But this first book takes place in England in 1937, 1938. So the specter of World War II is hanging over the, the characters and uh, even the children, you know, of course, are, are somehow aware of it. Like, I don't know about her earlier books. Maybe you can comment on this. It is not a plot-driven novel at all. It's very character-driven. It's got a lot of characters and not much happens other than the small things that happen in their lives. And what brings them together is just the family. That rings true to, the, to her two first novels, which I have read. Yeah. And uh, although I think there's some differences, what I hear between her earlier stuff and this series. So the family's name is Cazalet? Yes, the family's name is Cazalet, and it's really three generations. So you've got the grandparents who are nicknamed the Duchy and the Brig uh, in that sort of like upper class English way, right? Uh, you've got the three sons who are all married and then their unmarried daughter who's in her 30s who will clearly never marry. And then you have the sons, the grandchildren, basically, who range in age from 15 down to six. And do... You, if you've only read this first volume, maybe you can't answer this question, but do we meet the whole cast of characters in the first book? Or I think so. I think we're going to, I haven't read, we've talked about this, I'm, I hate spoilers. So I haven't, I don't know what's going to happen in the next books, if she's going to go on and just, you know, every book is to a two year period, you know, and this will end sometime in the mid fifties. But I'm positive from what I've sort of heard that we do at least go into the grandchildren's adulthood. So Grandma and Grandpa Casale, or should I say the Duchy and the Brig, you should say that. The opening of, of the novel. Yeah, yeah, they are. Uh, I mean, you know, probably in their yeah. 50s, 60s. Okay, so not maybe not that elderly. No, for, well, for the, yeah, yeah. for the time. Yeah. For the time. And her earlier novels, there's so much about infidelity and uh, deeply penetrating penetratingly psychological character development. Does that ring true for? Yes, very much, very much. I've heard that compared to her other stuff, the Cazalet Chronicles are actually somewhat light in tone. Later it could in be. tone. But it could you be. don't know because you haven't read what I've read. And I don't know because I haven't read what you've read. But it'll be really interesting for us both to, to weigh in on that again when we've read some more Elizabeth Jane Howard. This was a what five star read for you? Well, you know, four for now. I mean, okay. That, so you really enjoyed it? Yeah. And yeah. why? why? Why did you like it so much? Well, I like character driven novels. Um, I also like the fact that it's a four hundred page, well, over four hundred pages, I think, 
book, but it reads really fast. It, for me, it, it didn't drag. I think what you're talking about with the deep dive into characters, the reason this one might be a little bit more superficial is because there are so many characters, you know, there's at least 30. If you include the kid, she does have the point of view of the children, the point of view of the grandparents, the point of view of the parents, and sometimes the point of view of the servants. Where are you at with continuing to read the series? Well, you know, we'll see. Um, I definitely, you know, it's on my list. Right? The mood that you're in at that time. Um, yeah. I'm probably yeah. going to, I think I'm going to keep reading Elizabeth Jane Howard roughly in chronological sequence. So it'll be quite some time before I get to this. I might be dead before I get to this, <laughs> but I'm really curious about it. So I said that I've heard that the Castle Chronicles are comparatively lighter compared to her early fiction. And now I notice that the title of this novel is The Light Years. What's the title about? If it's, if it's not oh, a spoiler to say. I don't think it's, I have no idea, to, oh. to be honest. But I, sus, I'm, I was thinking about that. I wonder if it's maybe because it is these two years before World War II happens. And the characters, it, that is the one thread in this plotless novel that really does sort of bring everybody together is the fear that, about that, right? Because, you know, they didn't know. And maybe it's just that that waiting period of, of lightness before the, you know. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. And we were talking offline about how the fact that um, the only reason anybody should ever have heard of Kingsley Amos is that he, once, he was once married to Elizabeth Jane Howard. So. Exactly. <laughs> I've never read any, either Amos yet. I have no interest. It didn't feel too long. No, it's, you know, it's, um, again, I don't know how her earlier books are. There aren't chapters. There are breaks. So, you you know, you can stop. But there aren't really chapters, which I do think sort of, at, at least for me, that, that makes me read. Just switches from point of view to point of view to point of view. So that's when you sort of like say, okay, well, I'm going to stop here, have, you know, something to eat and come back to the book. But there's no chapters. Well, I'm going to make a prediction that you are going to go on to the second in the series. I don't know when, but I just have a feeling. So we'll see. No, for time. sure. And uh, <laughs> I'm going to hold off starting the Castle of Chronicles, but this conversation is reawakening my desire to to get the next book after after the long view and read it. And keep going with my chronological yeah. devouring yeah. of her her oeuvre. <laughs> One thing I did want to say about this book, what I particularly liked about it, which other people might not like, it does have a lot of detail about uh, what people wore and particularly what they ate. And um, when the whole family, all like, you know, 20 of them are at this country home outside of London, the, the duchy, the grandma talks to the cook and says, you know, okay, well, this is what we're going to have tomorrow. And then they kind of argue about it. And the duchy usually wins. There's two things that struck me. Well, one is just sort of the weird things that English people sometimes eat. But the other thing was just how, even though this is a well-off family, just how everything was reused, you know, from the, the night before, the leftovers. Like, I don't think people would do that today. You would just throw it away. But they scraped things off. If there was a little bit of meat left, they cut it up and made a mince or croquette or whatever. And the reason I bring that up is I know you like Barbara Pym. And I, I very much do. I also love Barbara Pym. And that's one thing I really like about her books, strangely, is the weird foods in it. From her debut novel, Some Tame Gazelle, I've heard about uh, cauliflower cheese for the first time and I've been making it ever since. Have Barbara, you made it? <laughs> I have. I have, yes. Ruth, I can talk to you all day about books. Will you come back and we can talk about another book someday soon? Okay, yeah, sure. Just let me know. This is great, David from Berkshire and of the wonderful book blog, David's Book World is back. Hello, David. Hi, Sean. Thanks for having me back. Well, you read the most interesting stuff. Uh, whenever I have a Look at your blog. You've got umpteen books that I've never heard of. And this is one of them. This is a work in translation by an, a writer from Côte d'Ivoire, or in English we say the Ivory Coast. Mm. It is called Standing Heavy, and the author goes by his one name, pen name, Gauss. 
translated from the French by Frank Wynne. Tell us about this book, David. This is a short novel about the experiences of, of black African men working as security guards in, in Paris. So it sort of follows in particular three men from Cote, Cote d'Ivoire and at different points during the 20th and 21st century and their, their changing experiences working as security guards and how society changes around them. And are they specifically from Cote d'Ivoire? Or yes, the, the, the particular ones that it focuses on are, but also in the sort of at the beginning of the of the book, you have a prologue which um, sort of shows the people going to be going to be recruited as security guards, and and that makes clear that there are men from all over Africa who have who are doing this. And so is the setting exclusively France or do, France, or do we see the, some of these characters uh, uh, in their homelands as well? It sort of, it does go back to, uh-huh. the, the little bits that go back to Cote d'Ivoire as well, but mostly it's sort of, is, it is in France. It, it's structured as three or four chapters, almost, almost like sort of stories perhaps, and then interspersed between them, there are also little sections of snippets which are the which are sort of representing the observations of the security guard in a shop or, or on break sort of observations thoughts passing comments so it's quite interestingly structured as well tell us about the title okay so the title standing heavy is sort of is, is mentioned at one point as a sort of slang which has propped up for events that it's described uh, all the various professions that require the employee to remain standing in order to earn a pittance. In order to earn a pittance. That's what, that's what standing heavy refers to. The temporal setting is from about the 1960s up to yeah, the nice present. Th- yeah, so it starts off in 1960 and we sort of meet the first, the first of the security guards is called Ferdinand. And he's sort of come over from Cote d'Ivoire. He's taken, uh, taken over from his cousin, who was a medical student and also worked part time at a security guard in a, as a security guard in a flour mill. So his cousin has got him this job in the in the flour mill, and people still mistake him for his cousin. But he he doesn't mind that because as far as he's concerned, he's he's got a good job. He's got some important work. He's He's going to make something for himself. So so one of the themes of that first story is that uh, Ferdinand is living in a student residence. And so there's a number of residences within Paris for students from different countries in Africa. So there's, there's one for Congolese students. There's one for West African students and so on. And one of the sort of themes of this story is that Ferdinand sort of feels almost contemptuous of the students around him because as far as he's concerned they talk a lot but don't really do anything whereas he's actually getting on for himself and making a living. The experience of the security guards in the 60s and 70s is contrasted later in the novel by um, Mm. things are different in the 1990s for others. Yeah so by the 90s you've got Osiri and uh, Kasum who are this the security guards that we meet in the in the 90s and 2000s and by then there is this whole separate industry which has grown up around having security guards from Africa so there is so there's a, a billboard which is sort of the main focus of Osiris' story which is this billboard he looks at this talks about sending money back to the home country and he has a job ironically enough in the same in the same flour mill as Ferdinand did, but at this point, it's not a functioning flour mill anymore. It's derelict, and his uh, his job as a security guard is to remove squatters, and uh, so he's sort of patrolling an empty an empty building rather than a fully working one. It sounds like this would be a unique perspective on France over those decades. Yes, I think so. Yeah, it was one of the things that attracted me to it. Was that it's sort of a a perspective not come, I haven't come out, come across before. I like to keep an eye out for sort of tran- translated books, which are from less less commonly translated areas, and there still isn't an awful lot of uh, African fiction in translation. 
and of course it's giving a giving a voice to people who would normally be uh, be silent literally because you they so you just see them standing there doing their doing their job standing uh, standing quietly most of the time and this is this is a book that gives voice to them I should also uh, put in a word for Frank Wynn, the translator who's done an excellent job David I hope you'll come back I will definitely This is very exciting. A brand new guest on Bite Size Book Chats, but a very prestigious booktuber in her own right. This is Miona Korn, a Chinese booktuber. Her booktube channel is The Bookish Land, and she is joining us today from the San Francisco Bay Area. Hello, Miona Korn. Hello, Xiang. It's so, I'm so excited to be here. Well, I'm starstruck, so very nice to meet you. And there might be a few people out there that don't know your channel, so... Tell us what you do over there. What kind of stuff do you read, Miona Korn? I read a variety of books. I would say that I read pretty widely, except romance. Sorry, cousin, if she's watching. <laughs> except <laughs> romance and high fantasy. But I also read like a lot of like nonfictions and all sorts of things. I'm a very curious person. <laughs> I think you're doing some... Uh, read-alongs or reading projects on your channel tell us a little bit oh, about that yeah. i am doing a uh, long-term reading project called um from and about asia reading project where we read about one asian country per month as well as the sub-region of that asian country because there are five sub-regions in asia and i don't see a lot of them getting represented um as well as like other popular countries so we just do a long-term project and talking about the books in the hopefully like more books from <coughs> underrepresented country that's great so we are here to talk about a book not really from asia i guess we would say it's by a south asian british writer it is called mm -hmm. this green and pleasant land by yes. aisha malik which mm -hmm. was, was published in 2019 yes and it sounds really interesting has a gorgeous cover mm -hmm. tell us there it is Yes. Tell us about this book, Miona Korn. So this book is set in an English town. So it has protagonist is a family, Phila and his wife, Marianne, and, and also the son of Marianne's first, first marriage. And they live in this English town and have a very quiet and peaceful life. And they are the only Muslim family in this town, but they are a very important part of the community. They go to community meetings, they discuss all sorts of things, and Marianne is a journalist, so she writes about things that is related or not related to this town. But the thing started to change when uh, Baila's uh, mother died because she summoned her, her son to her deathbed. And her dying wish is for Baila to build a mosque in this village, which is a silly idea to Baila, but she, he understands that uh, his mom just wants him to be connected more with his culture, with his traditions, but he is having a more distant lifestyle from his culture and tradition. So he didn't think about it too much, but then he couldn't this idea is just like surrounded him after uh, his mom died. So he finally brought it up to the community meetings. Uh, this is not a spoiler, it's all in the blurb. And even his wife is surprised by this decision. And this event stirred all kinds of things in this town. And they started to um, have a lot of dramatic <laughs> things happened and um, they started to rethink about what they thought they knew or what they thought they they have and what's the meaning of like friendship and family and community and even uh, identities. How recently did this family immigrate to the UK? I think they're actually not immigrated. They're like second generation. So, so the mother who died. Yeah, she was immigration. born abroad. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so she died in the UK. Yes, but and they don't live together. They don't live together. Her dying wish was that her son establish a mosque in his 
small British in a small British village, right? Yes. I'm just thinking. I have this picture in my mind of this quaint British village that's quite mm-hmm. small. Mm-hmm. You said, or I, what I understood was that they're the only Muslim family in the village. So, what was the point of creating a mosque there? Were there other Muslim people around? Mm, yeah, you have to read the book to find out. But I、okay. have to say. <laughs> But I want to say that、um, it's、uh, definitely to his mom. This is a very important part of their life. Interesting, and so I'm assuming that the, there is a part of the reaction of the community would be we could call Islamophobia. Yes. Yes. So there's、mm-hmm. themes of racism and Islamophobic. Stuff.、Mm-hmm. Where in time is this set? Is it like is this a post Brexit story, or do we get any sense of when?、Hmm. The book was pr- published in 2019, and I think、uh, the, the story is just set in the present of 2019,、uh, because、okay. that's something that I want to talk about. Because social media actually plays a part in the story, which I find fascinating. Why did you love this book so much? Yeah, I think this book gives me. A very peaceful vibe, but like under this peaceful cover or fabric,、uh, fabric is definitely a lot of invent going on under. And I love the contrast of the peacefulness and also the dramatic reactions of people. And also the character development is also、uh, very interesting. We have different kind of characters, as you said. The our characters is、uh, Islam phobic, and even them is very three dimensional. I feel like they got a very good portrait of how and why of their character、uh, personalities, and、uh, there are all kinds of different interactions between like different people from different religions. From different、uh, generations and like from people like all kind of different diverse people actually in this small town. <laughs> the blurb says they had lived there for eight years, and so they were feeling pretty pretty connected to the community, and it was kind、yes. of a sleepy little idyllic, quaint British、mm-hmm. town.、Mm-hmm. And then when he starts the ball rolling on this mosque. Mm-hmm. I would imagine that they would feel less connect, less of a sense of belonging in the community if there was a big negative reaction. I already feel some anticipatory sadness not having read、oh. the book, but that that would be kind of shaken up when you when you rock the boat.、Mm-hmm. If you kind of、uh, keep your head down and don't try to express your culture too much. Mm-hmm. Some people will accept you, but as soon as you try to be more of an individual and to to, to express your your ethnicity, your culture, your religion, some white people, a lot too many white people get get defensive and and、uh, racist. Yeah, that's one of the discussion I liked that was brought up by in this book, and I think you are definitely right. But besides that, there are actually a lot of Other like ideas that was brought up in this book too, and also a lot of discussions also about their family values. And、um, uh, like I said in the blurb, it says that his wife was quite surprised by his decision. So they also have some things that going on in this family, and、uh, also their other family members. So it's a lot about finding your identities in the community and also. Your family, and also because of these events, you get a better reflection on yourself too. That's very well said. And、uh, sometimes I struggle with issue-oriented fiction because the character development is weak. And it sounds、mm-hmm. like this is a character-driven novel that tackles some of these social political issues. So、yes. that sounds fabulous. I actually brought another book with me、oh, <laughs> that I want to compare it to: the、okay. uh, Trouble with Goats and Sheep.、Uh, this book doesn't have any.、Um, Oh, this book has religions plays a part in it, but it doesn't have a religious conflict in this. But I feel like the the atmosphere of the English quaint town is pretty much common. <laughs> I see. In the two stories, yeah, and that is the trouble with goats and sheep is by Joanna Cannon, and it came out in about 2016, I think. I read it、yes. when it first came out, really enjoyed it. Well, I'm really interested in the book, but even more than that, I am so happy that we have finally met, Mionacor. I know. <laughs> 
We have been so planning we, this for uh, quite some time. We have, and uh, you'll come back, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. James from Adelaide, Australia is back. Hello, James. Hi, nice to see you again. Nice to see you again, and pretty soon I'm going to need a wide-angle lens to get not only all of your library in, but all of your beard. <laughs> That's it, yeah. Just <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever lost a book in your beard? Not yet, not yet. Not but yet. They will so. come, I'm sure. <laughs> I, As I, I become so. more sedentary, yeah. I hope somebody's got a camera to record the moment. <laughs> anyway, we're here to talk about a book that James has been waxing passionate about for a few months now, ever since he read it. It is called Portable Magic, The History of Our Love Affair with Books by Emma Smith. Tell yes, us about that's this right. Book. In a sense, it's a collection of essays, but it does have a kind of a through a through line. It's really just a, a history and a exploration of the physical nature of books like the books not just books as objects but the way people interact with them as physical objects i mean everything from the structure of the book to you know the way that people are now extracting the dna from you know some sort of old monks sneezes in ancient books and things like that to sort of get the dna of people from 500 or a thousand years ago for sort of medical research but also you know the destruction of books you know books that went down on the titanic and books being burned and all kinds of things. So it's, yeah, just really, a, it's about books as physical things and the way people interact with them and the way the world does terrible things to them. <laughs> well, it does sound really interesting. Emma Smith is a Shakespeare prof at, at Oxford. Did this have an academic feel to it? Very much not. It, um, it, it, it no, no academies at all. It was actually very nicely written and, yeah, does not wander off into you know, horrible kind of uh, airless kind of writing. It's, um, I already actually, having read this, want to read her book on Shakespeare that she wrote beforehand. I think it's one of those, you know, sort of pelican introductions to a topic that Penguin is putting out now. And I thought I probably don't need to read any more about Shakespeare, but having seen how well done this was, maybe I need to read one more book about Shakespeare. So. <laughs> She's written several works of, of Shakespeare. Maybe the one that you just mentioned is This Is Shakespeare, but there's several. That's the that one, could. yes. And there's another one, Shakespeare's First Folio, Four Centuries of an Iconic Book. And yes, we so. Yeah, well, then that would definitely tie into this one because, again, the sort of the history of a, a particular physical object, in that case, of course, the, the, the first folio. But, yeah, this, this book kind of expands on that. It's not a book that it makes it... <laughs> This sounds maybe like one of those books that talks about books as precious objects. And I mean, obviously, I'm not someone who denies the importance of the book as a precious object, but it's, it's quite clear headed about the fact, that, for example, that most books, or at least a huge number of books, you know, they all end up being minced up and ended up, you know, being turned into road surfaces and all sorts of things. And it's not a, a hand wringing book about that kind of thing. It's just, looking at yes the way some books are precious some books are just they end up as mulch the life cycle of them as as with any other object um there's this huge variety of things that might happen and it just it's really interesting in the way that it, it approaches that and as i say the way books have ended up in odd places in history and things that have happened to them as a result of that you had said a moment ago that you didn't think you ever needed to read another book about shakespeare and that I'm going to use that as a jumping off point. I read a couple of years ago a memoir and essay form by Edmund White called the, the Unpunished Vice, A Life in Reading. And I loved it. I didn't expect to, but I, I really did love it. And I, when I talked about it on my channel, one of my book two besties said, that's great, but why would I read a book about reading when I could read a book, a work of literature? Yeah. So how would you answer that question about this book, well, James? I can see that the point of that question, but I would say, I mean, there, for example, there are books. I mean, I've got a whole shelf of books about books, inevitably. And for example, some of them, there's one, oh, I think it's just called Books by Larry McMurtry. And it's terrible. It's just, you know, it's the guy who spent his life writing and is working as a bookseller, a book, you know, secondhand book dealer, run, you know, huge numbers of bookshops I think you know set up one of those book towns somewhere in America 
and it's yeah it's really stale and dull and it doesn't bring anything of interest to it and so if that's the sort of thing you're expecting then yes you'd just be you'd run a mile there's no point reading that when you could be reading a good book but this it just it covers such a breadth of topics using books as the anchor um you know it sort of goes off for leaps around through sort of more than 2000 years of of and not just western history but you know global cultural history um, using books as the anchor, which is why I sort of talk about it in terms of being a collection of essays and that you could read any chapter individually. Um, but the effect altogether is this really kind of rich, slightly higgledy-piggledy look at the way people have encoded their thoughts for posterity and then the way those thoughts have then been treated. So it it's not just a book about books. It really covers a lot of material, but in a way that, you know, is particularly aimed at people who are obsessed with books and can see the charm of them. So, <laughs> okay, so would tell us more about this monk sneeze. I'm dying to well, know yes. a little bit more. Give it tease us a little bit more about that if you yeah. can. <laughs> well, she talks about you know you have these books that have been sitting in a library, you know, that were maybe handwritten or printed, you know, centuries ago, and have been sitting in libraries and have had literally centuries of readers. And people going through and swabbing and scraping in the margins where all these sort of ancient sneezes and coughs and skin cells and bits of hair have dropped off and scraping them out and doing DNA analysis on them. So you can sort of, you've got this handy little layered, disgusting, crusty <laughs> history of the human beings that have encountered the book. And so you can go through that and then, yeah, so sort of look at their biological nature and their medical nature. Um, which is quite interesting because I never thought of, I mean, you know, you see, you borrow a book from the library and it's got, you know, mysterious crunchy bits on it that you try and avoid, but I never thought of them as <laughs> something that happens over centuries that you can then use as a resource. I have this image of uh, centuries into the future, some scholars going through your library, which will probably be, you know, <laughs> not intact, but to spread across yeah. the globe and Very finding dispersed. bits of James's beard. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's it. I mean, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a book writer in her, and I'm not a, a a spine creaser or a page bender. But I sadly suspect that yeah, there'll be any amount of skin right. and beard and other disgusting matters. <laughs> Thanks, James. Thank you.